Hi there and welcome to what will be the first really of several little Christmas shedlets that I'll be doing this year. Uh, I know it's a busy period so I don't want to take up too much of your time but uh, I hope that you'll think it's worthwhile uh, spending a bit of time chewing over a thing or two. Now as you probably know I am a bit of a birder. I love poems about birds and uh, one of my favourites is Thomas Hardy's The Darkling Thrush. It's a great poem with an almost hymn-like quality to it. And it's very seasonal, uh, maybe especially pertinent right now with all that's going on out there. Hardy originally called it The Century's End, 1900. <laughs> now I know, not a very snappy title really. I think he did well to shift on to The Darkling Thrush. But you see, it was published on the 29th of December 1900, just a year into the new cen century with which you get the feeling uh, Hardy is none too impressed. The poem is really his uh, emotional response, his emotional r reflection, really, on the turn of the century and what he feared lay ahead. It was as if he felt like uh, a helpless onlooker on events that he neither welcomed nor could control. Not unlike us, actually, living through the nightmare of 2020. Um, and as we come toward the end of this year, uh, we've been hoping that the new year would bring something better. And hopefully it will. But, uh, you know, we're just not in a very good spell here in the UK at the moment, are we? And uh, so we also feel a certain sense of apprehension. Anyway, at the crossroads of the centuries, uh, life felt for Hardy like a frosty winter's evening when anyone at all in their right mind would be at home tucked up, huddled around a fire. So let me read you the poem. I leant upon a coppice gate when frost was spectre grey and winter's dregs made desolate the weakening eye of day. The tangled bind stems scored the sky like strings of broken lyres and all mankind that haunted nigh had sought their household fires. The land's sharp features seemed to be the century's corpse outlent, his crypt the cloudy canopy, the wind his death lament. The ancient pulse of germ and birth was shrunken hard and dry, and every spirit upon earth seemed fervorless as I. You know, it's interesting because the first verse, the way this poem begins, it could be really uh, any winter poem. It's, uh, it's just a reflection of December frosty and cold and um, when you want to get round nice warm fires. It's the second verse where the poet reveals the background to this poem, the thing that really is driving what he's uh, getting at here. And um, he's, he's mourning the loss of familiarity, basically. That's what this poem is about. And he's doing so in funereal terms. The past now is like a corpse being laid to rest. And the future, well, the seed of the future, he says, is shrunken, hard and dry, spiritless. But the great thing is, against all of this desolate and, and rather grim background, the poem has a surprise up its sleeve. At once, a voice arose among the bleak twigs overhead in a full-hearted evensong of joy illimited. An aged thrush, frail, gaunt and small, in blast beruffled plume, had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. So little cause for carolings of such ecstatic sound was written on terrestrial things afar or nigh around, that I could think there trembled through his happy good-night air some blessed hope whereof he knew, and I was unaware marvellous. So it's December. It's December now, isn't it? The deep midwinter, a season to gather hope like sticks. When our ancient ancestors would huddle around fires, take their fill of food and drink carefully stored for the winter months, sing cheerful songs and encamp the sun to return to fill the leaden skies. So it's little wonder, I think, that early Christians chose this time of year to celebrate the birth of Christ, the light of the world. It's a marriage, really, of Christian faith with pagan instincts. Pretty good, I reckon.
It's a time, certainly, when we need hope. And I stumbled on a, a very hopeful person a couple of years ago when I read the diaries of Etty Hillison. She was a young Dutch Jewish woman working in Amsterdam during World War II. Her diaries recount her spiritual journey as she sort of, it's really a story of spiritual awakening that, uh, that goes on in her life. And basically, she ended up finding the meaning of life through serving Jewish prisoners in a Nazi transit camp on the edge of Holland, a scary place next stop Auschwitz. And while she was there, she cared for her fellow inmates. She brought comfort and calm and and looked after all their needs. She was a kind of uh, go-between between between the prisoners and uh, the Nazi, uh, uh, you know, authorities in the camp. Week after week, she would witness trainloads of Jews being carried away. And then finally, it was her turn. And along with her family, Etty was flung into that great nightmare, transported to Poland on November the 30th, 1943, age 29. But, you know, somehow she managed to scribble a postcard and hurl it from the death train. And uh, miraculously, a farmer found the postcard and mailed it to the address that she had jotted on it. The card was, to use Hardy's terms, uh, an even song of joy illimited. It simply read, we left the camp singing. Oh my God, we left the camp singing. What a statement. To me, that postcard stands as one of the saddest and yet most defiant affirmations of hope from the entire Second World War. Earlier in her diary, she said that what ultimately matters is to bear the pain, to cope with it, And, and this is the key thing, and, she said, to keep a small corner of one's soul unsullied, come what may. (laughs) Wow. To go through all the stuff, yes, bear with it, go through it, but always keep a small corner of one's soul unsullied, come what may. We must reject all barbarism, she said. All barbarism within ourselves. Um, and violence. Never fan the hatred within. Because, she said, if we do, the world will not be able to pull itself one inch further out of the mire. The message of Christmas, uh, peace on earth, goodwill to all, is, is often reduced to, you know, sickly sweet sentimentalism. But at its core, Christmas is a statement of defiant hope. And we need that hope right now, a hope which is not naive, which is not an opiate, um, hope which can look fear full in the face and carry on singing. Even when the train seems to be heading in the wrong direction, keep on singing. Hope is, I believe, the single greatest act of defiance imaginable. Many of us feel anxiety or disappointment at the end of this year. I know I certainly do. Uh, Disappointment with our circumstances, Anxiety about the circumstances of our world, which is experiencing nothing less than a global trauma. But friends, pessimism and despair are the lazy way out. What our world needs, what we all need, is this defiant hope that was seen in the in the darkling thrush and in Etty Hillisum and so many other people who've in their own way shown us the way. And uh, you know, it is that joy filled even song, which announces that a new and better day will come and that we can do something to help that day to dawn. Let me show you something. Uh, It's a present, actually, from our friend Kirsty, who uh, made these wings for us a couple of years ago. Beautiful, shiny wings. Um, I mean, you may think that they belong to an angel, but I'm claiming them for my own. (laughs) The wonder of birds, you see, is that they can rise above what's going on, get a different perspective. And I reckon we too have got wings. We just forget to use them sometimes. Our wings, I would say, are our capacity to transcend what is going on around us. Our wings are our hope, the ability to get a new perspective, uh, which is our superpower, I think. 
Hope is our superpower, our wings. So do not let anyone or anything make you hopeless this Christmas. You've got your wings, use them. I'll see you later.